Tonight I'm presenting as a Renew volunteer. I have no commercial interest in hot water heat pumps. What I present tonight should not be used as a basis for you to buy any particular water heater. Rather, one purpose of this presentation may be that you all go home asking yourself some questions about hot water heat pumps. I also must say, although I've spent many hours preparing for tonight, I'm not the world's expert on hot water heat pumps. So I'd like to acknowledge Alan Pears and Matthew Wright, Richard Keach, who can't be here this evening, Craig Smith, organizations such as Renew, Beyond Zero Emissions, Steve Weltron, and all our members at My Efficient Electric Home for helping me to shape what I'm going to present here tonight. I'll start by saying that, um, but for the climate emergency, I wouldn't, be here. I wouldn't be here tonight. The last 10 years of my life would have been different. I would have gone on happily working in the oil and gas industry. And then I would have retired and spent my time looking at share portfolios. But tonight I'm here with you. But I am a chemical engineer trained in science. And a decade ago, I saw charts like this. And I recognize what it is. It's a runaway chemical and physical reaction. This chart shows our Earth's temperature going back 22,000 years from the present since we came out of the last ice age. Temperatures came up and then stabilized for 10,000 years in this wonderful period known as the Holocene. When, for better or worse, humans were able to establish agriculture, civilizations, and the world as we, until recently, knew it. But now at high speed, we're conducting this massive uncontrolled chemistry experiment on our Earth, our only home because some very wealthy and powerful people are frightened that their quest for more wealth and power might be slowed if we were to take steps to fix the problem. When I saw this chart, I realized I couldn't go on working, being paid to get more oil and gas out of the ground ever faster. So today I do other things, small things, like helping people to reduce their energy bills, to reduce their impact on our climate, on our environment, and on each other. But when I think back far enough, what I do today isn't actually a new thing for me. When I first got out of university in 1980, the USA was in the middle of one of those energy crises. And at my work, then in the fossil petrochemical industry, and at home, we were taking actions to deal with rising energy prices. We were wrapping our water heaters with insulation. We were draft proofing. We, at work, we used efficient industrial scale refrigeration systems, heat pumps, all those things. So I've sort of come full circle. I was fortunate in more recent years to have a role as a casual researcher here at the University of Melbourne. I published a string of reports and articles, all available now on the internet, just search my name, on topics such as pumped hydro energy storage, our electricity grid, renewable hydrogen as an export opportunity, the climate impacts of unconventional oil and gas production, and the economics of alternatives to fossil gas, such as heat pumps. I've done a lot of volunteering with organizations such as the Bayside Climate Change Action Group, the Australian Conservation Foundation, the Moreland Energy Foundation, Beyond Zero Emissions, Renew. Here are two articles I wrote for Renew Magazine. So I've been keen to spread the word about how people can improve their homes. So another way to spread the word, I started a Facebook group called My Efficient Electric Home. So tonight, don't shut off your phones, turn on your phones and join My Efficient Electric Home on Facebook. We would have some members in the audience tonight. If you're not a, a member already, we'll I'll be glad to have you. It's always rewarding to get home and we see how many new members we have. We're up to 9,000 members now, heading for 10,000 by the end of the year. So every day, nearly every minute, we have our members helping other members to improve their homes, to get their homes off fossil gas, to make their more, homes more comfortable and to save money. Resources such as Renew Magazine are excellent, of course, for providing information, but perhaps social media, for all its faults, is another way that helps to expand our reach. Tonight I've been asked by the Renew volunteers to do some further research and pull together a presentation on hot water heat pumps. So I'll start with a little teaser of what we've done down in our home in Sandringham. Two and a half years ago, my wife and I replaced our 20-year-old gas-fired water heater, which a uh, storage tank type. We replaced that with a top-of-the-line sand and hot water heat pump. I then set up the Sandin to run in the middle of the night with the compressor driven by cheap off-peak electricity. I reckon we went from spending about 78 cents per day on hot water when we were burning gas down to about 23 cents per day for the Sandin. 
So we had cut our hot water cost by 70%. This is almost like changing out a halogen with an LED. 70%, 70, but wait, there's more. A year ago, we expanded our solar PV system and we now run our sand in the middle of the day, most often with the compressor running on self-generated electricity, electricity that we don't get paid much for if we were to sell it out on the grid. And so our hot water costs have dropped a bit more to 15 cents a day. So it was 78 cents a day, now 15. That's a drop of 80%. We now pay one fifth of what we used to pay for hot water. This must be about the cheapest hot water that you'll get in Melbourne. And it's pretty close to being created with 100% renewable heat and electricity. If we use more hot water, we'd save even more than the $230 per year there, but it's generally just my wife and myself. That's our personal situation. But our results were not surprising. This chart, it's fairly complicated and I'll come back to it later, but it illustrates that sure enough, there is a massive range in the costs of heating water. If you apply a high electricity price and then heat water with a simple resistive electric heater, you get these brown columns and you can pay 15 times as much to heat water versus what I pay using a heat pump. The heat pump are the blue columns. Or with a high gas price, you could pay four times as much as what we pay. So clearly it pays to think about at your home how you are heating your water. But the story of the all electric home is about more than just hot water. The most recent economic analysis of how we can save not only by heating water with heat pumps, but also heating living spaces with heat pumps, cooking with electric ovens and induction cooktops, and ultimately disconnecting completely from the gas grid. These economics were most recently documented by Renew, or as, as they were known in July 2018, as the Alternative Technology Association in this report. Renew's analysis <coughs> showed how people could save thousands after investing in the right equipment for their homes. And since then, we see a bit more in the media describing the favorable economics of the all-electric home. Some communities around the world are thinking about or have even banned the use of fossil gas in some applications. So focusing just on the hot water heat pumps, what will I cover tonight? Here's an outline. First, rather than jumping straight in about how we can heat water, I'll ask, how much hot water do you need anyway? And then I'll discuss how heat pumps and the refrigerant cycle work and how these machines harvest free renewable energy from the th thin air outside your house. Then I'll mention all the things that heat, pump can do be heat pumps can do beyond just heating water. And next we'll see, even though hot water heat pumps are amazing, few Australian homes actually have them. So why is this? Then should you be interested in buying a hot water heat pump, I'll describe what are the different things you should think about and try to compare different makes and models of hot water heat pumps. But then I'll compare hot water heat pumps with other ways to heat water, such as by burning fossil gas. And toward the end, I'll offer, offer reminders about why we should be concerned about burning fossil gas. And lastly, just in case many of you already own hot water heat pumps, let's discuss how we can get the most out of them. Okay, let's go. How much hot water do you need? Why does anyone need a dedicated hot water heater? First, for clothes washing, maybe. Maybe not. We just bought a new clothes washer and I was a bit annoyed to find it heats its own water. Not with a heat pump at all, but with a resistive electric heating element. So our fancy heat pump doesn't even get a look in with our clothes washing at all. And of course, we probably all know that clothes can be washed in cold water. Second, do you need a dedicated water heater for dishwashing? Our dishwasher, dishwasher does not heat its own water. And of course, many people wash dishes by hand. And in that case, having a ready supply of hot water is useful. A third reason, how about hot water for washing your body? At the sink perhaps or in the shower, or you might need to wash someone else's body, such as a child might have a bath in a tub. Fourth is hydrotherapy. I know I stand around in the shower trying to clear my sinuses, and others might like to relax in a bath from time to time. So that's probably where most of us use our hot, hot water, but the point I'm making is that you might not need to use that much. Here's our setup at home. We have a shower dome over our shower stall and we use an efficient meath and shower head. The shower dome is amazing technology, especially in winter, because it allows you to spend zero time in the shower on the process of just trying to get warm. With a shower dome, should you be able to fit one over your shower stall, your shower instantly heats up when you turn on the water. Our daughter lived overseas for a year. On returning home, the thing she missed most wasn't mom and dad, it was the shower dome. <laughs> Shower heads. <clears throat> There's many three-star rated shower heads on the market that use seven to nine liters per minute. 
But how good do those shower heads actually feel? How good is the shower you get? The trick of the Methan shower head is that each of those jets you see, they're actually two jets, and the water from each jet is directed to crash into each other. And I call them double impinging jets. So this technique atomizes the water droplets and gives you a good feeling shower. We use the three-star methane, which I measured at eight liters per minute, but there's also the ultra-low flow methane, which is said to go down to four and a half liters per minute. But you could compare this with old-style shower heads that I've measured in some homes at 40 liters a minute. So this is another factor of 10 difference, like halogen versus the LED. So let's say you have a heat pump with a medium-sized 250-liter tank. You hang around in the shower for six minutes, and let's assume cold water is mixed with hot at a ratio of one to two. During your shower, you would use 32 liters of hot water. A 250-liter tank then would last for eight showers. My point here is not just that modern heat pumps are good, but it's also the modern shower heads matched with a heat pump that are excellent. But let's move on to how heat pumps work. Let's pretend that I'm not talking about heat pumps, <coughs> or rather I'm talking about a water pump. Let's imagine I'm standing halfway up a hill. Left on its own, water wants to run downhill. But if we want water at the top of the hill, what do we do? We go out and we buy a water pump. Like water, heat is also a thing. And left on its own, heat, heat likes to flow downhill, in a sense, from a hot place to a cold place. Like heat would like to flow from your hot kitchen right now on a hot summer night, it would like to, that heat would like to flow into your refrigerator because it's cold in there and then to get into your food. So how do we reverse that? How do we keep heat away from food? How can we get heat to flow uphill opposite to the way it would naturally like to go? For that, we don't need a water pump, we need a heat pump, which is another way of saying we need a refrigerant cycle. In the refrigerant cycle, there's a fluid, which we'll call refrigerant, which goes around and around and around in the cycle that you see there. In this cycle at the bottom of the graphic, we have the expansion valve. When high pressure refrigerant expands across that valve, it, the refrigerant gets very cold. You may have noticed that high pressure fluids get cold when they expand if, for example, you've ever let LPG out of an LPG bottle by mistake. Or if you've noticed how cool the air coming out of a bicycle tire can be when that air expands. That's this expansion principle. So when that expanded cold refrigerant next flows into the heat exchanger called the evaporator, in this heat exchanger, the cold refrigerant can pick up heat. For example, the heat you're trying, that was trying to get into your food, instead it's collected by the cold refrigerant in your refrigerator, thus preserving your food. But next, now what do we do with this heat that we've collected in the evaporator? How do we get rid of that heat? And how do we make this whole process go around? Well, next we'll send the warmed up refrigerant to a compressor. The compressor is the device that forces the refrigerant to go around and round, but the compressor also has the effect of making the refrigerant which had warmed up somewhat in the evaporator, well now it gets really hot coming out of the compressor. Compressing fluids heats them up, as you'd notice if you feel the hot air coming out of the back of a vacuum sweeper. So now the refrigerant is hot, as well as being at high pressure, it next goes through the second heat exchanger called the condenser, where we cool the, refrigeration, the refrigerant down by having it lose its heat, say to the environment, to the surroundings, to the air, say, moving around your fridge in the kitchen. So we lose that heat to the kitchen. In this way, heat was, that was trying to get into your food is rejected back out into your kitchen. So those are the five parts of the refrigerant or the heat pump cycle. The refrigerant itself, and then the expansion valve, the evaporator, the compressor, and the condenser. A very useful invention for keeping food cold, but good also for keeping living spaces cool. That was the invention of the air conditioner. Same principle as a refrigerator, except in this case, we're aimed to keep a living space cool. So we need to ensure the heat we are pumping away ends up not in your kitchen, but completely outside the house. That is why if you go stand beside the outside unit of your air conditioner in summer, when it's running, when your air con is trying to cool your lounge room, you'll find it is quite hot outside your house where that air is being blown around outside because that is the heat that is being pumped from your lounge room to outside your house. But now we can reverse that cycle. And rather than cooling a room, we can heat a room. Same principle, except this time, we use the very cold refrigerant to capture heat from outside your home and to then use the heat pump cycle to bring that heat back into our living space. Now, this is the tricky one for people to imagine. On a cold winter day, people don't realize there's still heat in the air outside when in fact there's always heat in the air. 
our air temperature would have to get down to absolute zero or minus 250 degrees Celsius like on the surface of Pluto before there would be no more heat in that air. But fortunately here on planet Earth, our sun is strong even in winter and nearly every day our sun puts heat into our air that we can then capture using the right refrigerant and using the right equipment and we use that heat from the sun to cheaply heat our homes. The equipment I'm talking about is known on mainland Australia as a reverse cycle air conditioner, but everywhere else in the world, it's known as an air source heat pump. A heat pump that can extract free renewable heat from the thin air outside your house, which finally brings us to a heat pump that heats water. Again, the same principle. It's a reverse cycle air conditioner that heats water. Sometimes they look like the sand in here, which in, indeed resembles an air conditioner next to a hot water storage tank. They can also look like these old quantum units where the compressor and evaporator are mounted on top of the water tank, and the whole thing is just one single piece. So I've shown a number of examples and shown that heat pumps are good for many things, but wait, I'm not done, there's more. Clothes drying. Up to a few years ago, I didn't even know that heat pump clothes dryers were a thing. But here in Melbourne now, I'm surprised to find heat pumps seem to be already the most common type of clothes dryer you see for sale. The efficiencies are incredible because not only do they have the refrigerant cycle going around, but there's also the air and the moisture cycling around too. These things are so incredibly efficient because it's hard to see where any energy is lost from this system. They're much better than the old style dryers using simple electric resistive technology where essentially all the energy is lost from the system. And lastly, heat pumps are used in industry too. They can operate at temperatures so hot they can generate steam. There are many industries burning expensive gas in Australia to do simple things like just heating water. So those industries should be switching over to heat pumps powered by cheap or even free renewable heat and electricity. So I'd like to emphasize again that the reason hot water heat pumps and space heating heat pumps can be cheap to operate is because most of the heat they provide started as free renewable heat held in the air outside your home heat that was put there by our sun. Air source heat pumps are another way to capture renewable solar energy without you even having to put anything on your roof. This slide shows that for every one unit or one kilowatt hour of electrical energy that you have to buy to run the compressor, you get from this device, say, four units of energy added to your water. My wife thinks this is the best way to describe the whole concept. Buy one, get four. How often does that happen? How good are air source heat pumps? That leveraging effect, buy one, get more, is known as the coefficient of performance, or COP, about which I will explain later. So let's think of how all this fits with the all-electric home. Shown here are three ways to use renewable energy at home. One is the well-known solar PV panels, which I call the bling on the roof. But what if you don't have a roof? Don't despair. You don't need a roof in order to collect renewable heat with a heat pump. And indeed, this home shown here that had only a small six panel, one kilowatt solar PV system. Um, and so four times as much energy is collected at this home using heat pumps, four times more than the amount of renewable energy collected by the solar PV panels. The Australian government recognizes that hot water heat pumps recover renewable heat, and that is why renewable energy credits, known as STCs or small scale technology certificates, these rebates apply and can save you money when you buy a hot water heat pump in just the same way as when you buy a solar PV system. Are you ready for this? <laughs> too much information, but I gotta do this. I'm a chemical engineer. Hopefully not too much for this intelligent audience. <clears throat> this slide illustrates the thermodynamic fundamentals of heat pumps for those who wanna go to the next level. Key to the refrigerant cycle and making it all work in the first place are the special physical characteristics of the refrigerant fluid. And that is why we have hundreds of refrigerants that people have tried, all going by funny code names, R22, R410A, R744. Chemically, some of the refrigerants are simple, like propane or ammonia, and even water and carbon dioxide can be used as refrigerants. These are sometimes called the natural refrigerants. Others are synthetic chemicals and sound more complex, like 1112 tetrafluoroethane. But what is important for the refrigerant is how it appears when you sketch it up on a chart like this, where the axes are heat content or enthalpy and pressure on the y-axis. So as we go across a certain horizontal line here, the refrigerant is at a certain pressure, but how does the temperature and phase of that refrigerant change as we add more heat to it, as we go across this way? Is that liquid, is it, is it a liquid, is it a gas, is it something else? You can then superimpose the operating conditions of 
the refrigerant cycle equipment on these physical properties of the refrigerant. <coughs> and starting from the point marked one over there, we can track what happens as, as the refrigerant is compressed, going up to two, cooled in the condenser, coming over to five, and dropped to low pressure and temperature across the expansion valve down to number six, and then warmed up again through the evaporator to get back to point one. Now what is really important if we want an efficient heat pump is the length of the green line. This represents how much free renewable heat we can pick up in the evaporator. We want the green line to be much longer than the red line, which represents the energy we have to pay for to drive the compressor in order to make the whole thing go around. The ratio then of the green line to the red line is shown in this formula here, which gives the coefficient of performance or COP. If the green line is two or four or six times longer than the red line, this means this heat pump could have a maximum theoretical COP of two or four or six, or you could say an efficiency of 200% or 400% or 600%. Those efficiencies are quite remarkable, especially if you compare these with the theoretical efficiency of a resistive electric type water heater of just 100%, or the even lower efficiency of gas burning equipment, where the efficiency of gas burning equipment is always less than 100%, because you buy gas, the first thing you do is set fire to it, and part of the heat goes up the flue. So heat pump efficiencies of 200 or 400 or 600% versus electric, electric resistive efficiencies at 100% and gas burners even lower. One more thing, since heat pumps pump heat from a cold place to a warm place, it stands to reason that the colder it is outside, the harder the heat pump much work, must work. Or the warmer it is outside, the easier it will be. So tomorrow your heat, hot water heat pump is not going to have to work very hard at all. Their efficiency or COP drops off as it gets colder outside as shown by this graph. It might be a somewhat linear decline with temperature or there could be some quick drop off points depending on the design of the system. So in winter, any hot, wa hot water heat pump will cost you more to run than it costs to run it in the summer. And that is without even thinking about the heat losses from the storage tank and from the pipe work. So that's how heat pumps work. All the technologies continue to improve, compressor design, high pressure materials, control systems, refrigerants, so that the heat pumps available today are much more efficient and effective than the heat pumps available, say, 10 years ago. So heat pumps are pretty amazing, aren't they? No, they're not. Did you know, in 2014, hot water heat pumps made on, up only 3% of the water heaters used in Australia. These remarkable design, devices that can be so cheap to operate, and that harvest free renewable heat are still a minor thing on the Australian market. Unlike heat pumps for clothes drying, hot water heat pumps have yet to take the market by storm. We have a way to go, and perhaps that's what tonight's presentation is about. Will providing information to the public about hot water heat pumps stimulate their uptake? Still, I was a bit surprised when I saw this chart, only 3%, but it is a chart from 2014. Perhaps things have improved in the last five years. But here's another thing that surprised me. This is a partial list from the Clean Energy Regulator of registered hot water heat pump brands and models on the Australian market. It turns out there are a total of 259 heat pump makes and models on the Australian market. So you can see we aren't limited by the number of models available. But is this necessarily a good thing? Perhaps having so many brands available confuses people, as having wide choice often does. So we have all these positive characteristics of hot water heat pumps. Thanks, Alan, for the last few that I put on there. They can be low cost to operate in both summer and winter. They work well with solar PV and can use 100% renewable energy. Renewable energy credits and other rebates are available to reduce the purchase cost. So what are the barriers to uptake? Here's another list. One, consumers haven't heard of heat pumps, or if they have, they don't know how they work. The technology can be tricky to explain. The gas industry is happy to spread doubt and confusion. Heat pumps that came on the market a decade ago weren't up to the job, so a bad reputation was established, and some plumbers have better memories than elephants. <laughs> Government regulations are out of date. Some building regulations in Victoria actually force you to occupy valuable roof space with a potentially crappy, crappy solar thermal water heater, and they don't allow you to install a heat pump. Some heat pumps are pricey, even with the rebates, up to $4,000. Some models have too large of a physical footprint to fit near a home, especially with some uh, small units and townhouses. Heat pumps make noise, just like any air conditioner, although some models are better than others. Too much choice, we have all these models with different characteristics, and for some of these important characteristics, 
such as the actual annual running cost and noise, it is impossible for the consumer to access useful and valid information to compare. How can we even try to compare all these heat pump brands? What things, what features, what functions should we compare? Yeah, that's slide 64, it's coming up. <laughs> I came up with 24 things we could compare between different hot water heat pumps. It's a long list, so is this a reason why heat pumps are slow to gain market share? Some things are relatively easy to compare between different makes and models of heat pumps because information is readily available, no one's hiding it. Some examples are the water volume in the tank, the physical size of the equipment, what refrigerant is used. But the key items I've highlighted in red, it can be impossible for consumers to find data to make a fair comparison of these features. Let's start with the efficiency of the device, the COP or coefficient of performance that I mentioned, which can translate, of course, to your annual running costs. Unlike many appliances on the Australian market, there is no standardized regulated consumer information available that describes the running cost of a hot water heat pump. Another parameter, noise. When you look at what vendors publish, you can get some idea that this brand might be noisier than th this other brand, but by how much? And especially in the exact location where you plan to install it at your house. Will it disturb your next barbecue? Will you be able to hear it in your bedroom when you're trying to sleep? Will your neighbors be able to hear it in their home? How will you know before you buy the device how noisy it might be? Tank insulation and standing heat losses. If in your house you don't use much hot water, a lot of the energy you'll put into the water heater won't be because of the hot water you actually use, it'll be because of the heat that's lost out from the tank insulation and the pipework. How is a consumer to work out how important that is? Longevity, if you spend $4,000 on a water heater, how long is it gonna last? Warranties for some parts might be only three years. It better last a lot longer than that. And why wouldn't it? Wouldn't a hot water heat pump be about as robust as a refrigerator? And how often do modern refrigerators break down? But how do we know how long a heat pump will last, especially if a device has only been on the market for a few years? Do consumers find all this confusing and unsettling before making such a big purchase? I suppose they do. This is a long list, but I'll keep going and compare some aspects of just four different heat pumps. And you're not meant to actually be able to read it, I don't suppose. First, a disclaimer, all the information here could be wrong. Do your own research. But tonight, even if you, some of the data on this slide is wrong or out of date, I can use it to make some points. I've got four heat pumps listed here from left to right, possibly from higher to lower purchase cost and also maybe ranked from greater to lesser capability, a Sandum, a Quantum, a Steve Weltron, and a Chromogen Medea. I picked a range of tank sizes just to make sure we're comparing apples and oranges from 315 liters for a large family or for someone who absolutely wants their heat pump to uh, only charge up once per day off their solar system, uh, down to tank sizes of just 170 liters. There are different physical sizes and configurations of the equipment. The Sandin is a true split system where the heat pump can be mounted outdoors, has to be out, well, should be outdoors, but the tank might be sheltered indoors, whereas the Stiebel and the Chromogen are true all-in-one units. One of these doesn't have an electric resistive boost element, but the others do. But how is that boost element controlled? When do they kick in? There are three different refrigerants with very different global warming potentials of those refrigerants. I've listed some COPs, coefficient of performance, but as I said, there is not necessarily any regulation of this info, so it may be meaningless to attempt a comparison. There are significantly different noise levels, some differences in the warranties and some big differences in the installed costs, even with the rebates included, $4,000, $2,000, down to practically free with the rebates paying most of the way. So how do you decide? You might want to get some advice. <coughs> Renew offers an advice service, and Renew has published some comparison information, such as this booklet from 2017, and a bit of a hot water buyer's guide, but the information available to Renew back in 2017 was rather sparse. We discuss hot water heat pumps over at My Efficient Electric Home on Facebook. There are the Whirlpool online fora where you can discuss hot water heat pumps. And for re further reading on this whole situation, you can check out what's been published by uh, the governments over on www.energyrating.gov.au. But as I've been saying, unlike a lot of other appliances, what you will not find there is any easy comparison of what your annual operating costs will be. This slide shows the new climate zone specific star ratings that you can use to compare the running costs for space heating and cooling heat pumps, so air conditioners. But you won't find these sort of star ratings for hot water heat pumps. But all is not completely lost because as I mentioned before, 
we can use those renewable energy certificates or STCs as a way to compare operating costs. Showing this table again and highlighting the STCs, you see they range from 34 for the sand and down to 30 for the chromogen Medea. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but it is quite significant. Warning again that there are lots of reasons to say we are comparing apples and oranges here, the tank sizes being one difference. Anyway, my simple message is once you've narrowed the field down to say two or three heat pumps that might meet your needs in every other way, you can use the STCs as sort of a ranking guide for operating costs. But the STCs without some sort of translation that we're working on won't directly give you insight into running costs. In your state or territory, there may be other ways to compare heat pumps. The Victorian Essential Services Commission, for example, provides a ranking of percent annual energy savings for heat pumps when compared to resistive electric water heaters, so that might be helpful. Someday we might see a more user-friendly star rating for water heating heat pumps. A government regulatory consultation process has been underway for some years, so we wait for a way to compare water heating heat pumps. But what if you're not even completely sold on the idea of getting a heat pump and you want to compare heat pumps with other water heating devices? Uh, how do you do that? <coughs> What are those other ways to heat water? Well, this table uh, lists the heat pump up there as the number one way to heat water. Number two and three, those are resistive electric water heaters, either using a storage tank or an instantaneous tankless type, as you can see pictured here. Four and five, those are gas or LPG fired water heaters, again, either using a storage tank or the instantaneous tankless type. I said before, it can be difficult to compare the cost of all these different ways to heat water. So this chart, which you saw before, where I applied a range of gas and electricity prices, just to highlight there can be at least a factor of 15 in the difference of the cost of heating water. But please note that this chart does not include, does not include the costs of actually keeping water hot in the tank once you've heated it up. Comparing water heaters gets more complicated once you try to account for the standing heat losses from the storage tank and piping, but nevertheless, perhaps this chart is of some use. One thing this chart highlights is how the gas industry can get away in their advertising with saying that using gas is cheaper than something. Those gas industry ads never explain cheaper than what? Indeed, the gas industry compare their equipment with the resistive electric heaters, and they pretend that heat pumps don't exist. Lastly, on this table is item, is item six, uh, something that's been very popular for many years in Australia, even though it might underperform, that's the rooftop solar thermal hot water system, uh, using either gas LPG or electric resistive to boost it in the wintertime in particular when it's not getting enough of the sun's heat. Years ago, Richard Keach and Beyond Zero Emissions compared rooftop solar thermal with hot water heat pumps and produce these charts. On these charts, the red line shows how much energy you need throughout the year to run the compressor on the heat pump. And you can see the red lines are fairly flat throughout the year in most all of the locations, Melbourne, Sydney, Darwin, and Perth, indicating that even though heat pumps do work easier in summer, the difference between summer and winter isn't necessarily that large. Whereas the blue line shows the energy you'd need to boost a solar thermal system. These charts show that solar thermal systems are excellent in Darwin with hardly any boosted needing at all. But outside of Darwin, solar thermal systems can require a lot of boosting outside of the summer months. Some solar thermal units in Melbourne don't actually collect much solar energy at all during the winter months. And these solar thermal systems are rather complicated. You do need a degree in chemical engineering, I think. With all the pumps, the non-return valves, the glycol systems, et cetera, needing to be up, installed up on your roof, and this all increases cost and complexity. The pages of My Efficient Electric Home are littered with stories of members who thought their solar thermal system was working for them, but due to some failure or poor installation right to begin with, some systems were even losing more heat throughout the year than they were collecting which means you are relying heavily on the gas or electric resistive boost to provide your hot water. And unless you monitor this closely, you might not even know. The bottom line is why these days, why plonk a lonely water heater on your roof when effective heat pumps exist and you're probably gonna to wanna to put solar PV on your best north facing roof spaces anyway. Vendors that sell both heat pumps and rooftop solar thermal systems 
they report that they're not selling many solar thermal systems anymore to individuals. But still, because of some out-of-date government relations, uh, regulations, new homes continue to be built, which include relatively ineffective flat panel solar thermal hot water systems rather than heat pumps. So <clears throat> what were those ways to heat water again? Item three, the tankless or instantaneous electric is interesting because as I mentioned, heat losses from hot water storage tanks are large. And so the tankless devices have some attraction and they're all electric. When I lived in Germany in an apartment in 1981, that's what I used. One shortcoming with tankless electric, however, is that for anything other than small hot water flows, you may need to pay to have a three-phase electrical connection and a larger water heater. But on the other hand, with some of those amazing four liter per minute shower heads, you might just get by even with a single phase electrical connection and an instantaneous hot water system. That leaves number two on this list, the resistive electric storage tanks. Uh, these would often would heat up overnight on cheap off-peak electricity rates in order to keep the coal burning plants ticking over during the low electricity demand times in the middle of the night. And you'd think because these simple things aren't heat pumps and they can't collect renewable heat and they use three or five, three to five times as much as electricity to heat water as a heat pump, you'd think they'd be dying out. But some folks who have very large solar PV, solar PV systems are saying, bugger it, I'll go with a cheap resistive electric hot water service and use the vast amounts of excess electricity I sometimes generate to heat my water. But let's look at this. Here's our house, our solar PV and our sand and hot water heat pump. I'll end up showing a couple of recent November days. This is the 6th of November. On this pretty good solar day here, 6th November, our solar PV uh, up to six, nearly six kilowatts. Our solar PV was capable of um, producing that much electricity, which is shown in the green and the sandin, which is this gray block here. It only draws about one kilowatt of electricity for a few hours to heat up our water, and then we're good for another 24 hours with the 300 liters of hot water. So our solar PV system here, you see, easily covers the needs of the sand and on a good solar day. Heat pump makers such as Steve Weltron, who strongly support the idea of the all electric home, they're trying to spread the word that using a hot water heat pump in this way is essentially a thermal battery, a way to store energy as heat for use later on. And in this way, it might be a lot more cost effective to invest in a hot water heat pump as a way to use, self-consume your solar PV generated electricity and to store the energy rather than buying an actual electrical battery. So you've got a hot water battery, basically. But um, back to this graph, I've now added another day, the 7th of November, which is not as good as far as the sunshine went. And we weren't so lucky. And um, I picked a really bad time for the sand to automatically come on at 12 o'clock because that's when the sun just magically disappeared. So the needs of our sand and weren't fully covered and the white space above the gray is the electricity that on that day we had to buy from the grid to heat our water. So bad luck. But what if instead of having this efficient heat pump, we were heating all our water with a simple resistive electric heater that might use four times as much electricity to do the same job? This chart shows the bad solar day again. Uh, that was up. So you see they're generating here up to about nearly five kilowatts on this day, six kilowatts the day before. So that's the scale up to five kilowatts. Um, but this chart shows that bad solar day again, but with a red rectangle showing the electricity we would have needed if we were heating our water just with electric resistive and no heat pump. So we would have needed a lot more electricity and you can see our gap would have been big and most days we'd have trouble covering all of that with our solar PV system. This becomes especially critical in winter when solar PV output really declines, whereas a good heat pump wouldn't care that much if it's winter. It will just go on all year long collecting free renewable heat from the sun uh, that the sun has put in our air. So my message is don't waste your solar PV electricity by matching it with electric resistive water heater. Match it with a heat pump. Okay, as I get closer to my last few slides, I'd like to return a bit to the bigger picture. What's so bad about gas? Why should we be getting our homes off gas? And remember, I used to work in the gas industry. And then after that, we might conclude, gee, we're pretty lucky given the climate crisis and everything else, and the gas industry 
It's trying to frack everywhere they can. Uh, we're lucky that effective heat pump technology exists and is now available for our use. Because first, gas will burn a hole in your pocketbook. Gas used to be cheap in Eastern Australia, but no longer. Because gas is now exported from Eastern Australia to overseas buyers. Overall, in 2020, 81% of the gas produced across Australia will be exported. The big increases in gas prices seen in Eastern Australia have even impacted our electricity prices. And they've been a big shock for gas users in industry, as well as for homeowners and renters. Cheap gas isn't coming back, so we might as well get on with the heat pumps and solar PV and draft proofing and insulating and everything else we can do to uh, reduce the energy use at our home. Cheap gas isn't coming back. In fact, gas could get more expensive. This is the second time I've presented this chart to the public. The first was earlier today in Ballarat. Because these charts were only recently published by the Australian Energy Market Operator a few months ago, and for the first time, ESSO and BHP have let everyone in on the big secret. The Bass Strait gas fields are, after more than 50 years, finally running down. So now we see for winter 2025, just six years from now, the Australian Energy Market Operator has no idea where half of our gas is going to come from in winter 2025 assuming we continue to burn as much as we always have. Thus, AGL and others are looking at importing gas into Victoria and into New South Wales and, and into South Australia. You might have heard about the plans AGL has for gas import via an LNG ship in Western Port Bay. This top chart here is 2018, and the bottom one is 2025, six, six years later, six, seven years later. The gas demand, uh, is the jagged line across the top, and that's for New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. That's gas demand for those states. So it leaves Queensland out of the interconnected East Coast system. <laughs> and we see the jagged line, which is the, the gas demand for those states and territories. In 2018, most of the demand in those states was met from gas from Bass Strait and other smaller fields shown in the red. The other colors, colors up the top show some top up from, from Queensland coming down the pipelines and some gas coming out of the Otway gas storage facility, which uh, gets filled up in summer and gets discharged in winter. So that's the tiny orange bit at the top. But you can see 2018, everything's been sweet like it's been for the last 50 years with Bass Strait providing the gas needed. But the next chart is 2025, and you can see the red, the gas from Bass Strait. Well, they're not able to produce any more than this throughout 2025. Um, so production from Bass Strait by then will have dropped off heaps. And even with lots of extra, but not cheap gas coming down from Queensland, that's the yellow, we see a big shortfall. So here in winter 2025, we don't know where half of our gas is coming from. Anybody feel like buying a gas, gas fired water heater right now? <laughs> and the other thing is, um, yeah, to meet this winter demand, which actually goes on for about six months, so it's kind of a long peak demand period, some gas companies see this as an opportunity to import expensive gas. But I see it as an opportunity to leave this fossil fuel behind. 2025, it's not long to go now. We can see that today is not the time to be buying a new gas heater that you were thinking might last you out to 2035. These charts aren't being talked about much in the media, which is surprising because this is absolutely game-changing on the East Coast energy system. This is huge. Victoria and neighboring states have been burning through Bass Strait gas for over 50 years, and now that's coming to a close. SO and BHP have even put the assets up for sale, so they're getting out. They, this is going to be a shock to our energy systems, perhaps even larger than you know, everything that's been going on on the electricity and the coal side but few people are talking about it. The gas industry isn't talking about it because they want you to keep on buying gas heaters. It wouldn't sound very good if people start asking questions about what's actually happening in winter 2025. But the green groups aren't talking about this either because they know that what will happen, every federal politician from the PM on down will say that this is a good reason that we should be fracking Victoria. But this will eventually hit the news, so stay tuned. The other thing about fossil gas, despite what the gas industry radio ads say, is that fossil gas isn't a clean fuel. In fact, it might be the dirtiest fuel. This slide shows some farm and forest areas of the coal seam gas regions of Queensland. And remember, we're all connected up all the way from here to Queensland. 
uh, we've got before and after the gas industry came to town. The slide on the right shows 150 well pads and all the interconnecting roads and other infrastructure and water holding ponds, et cetera, where they'd had to clear out the, the, farm, the farmers and the, uh, the forests. That's 150 wells, but they planned 40,000. So can you imagine what that looks like? <coughs> what you have to do is to mentally multiply this image at least 300 times. And so it's gonna end up across Grattan Street somewhere. There's people living amongst all that. They try to raise families and farm and run businesses amid all that, or at least they did. Many have been paid out and have left. Lots of things are ch chasing the people out of their homes up there. One impact is the release of who knows what into the air. Here are some images of me up there with an ABC journalist and a cameraman along. And I also had this special $130,000 military grade infrared camera capable of seeing the release of invisible methane gas. You can't normally see methane gas with the uh, naked eye. The fossil gas industry says their product is clean without bothering to measure or report these emissions. And you know, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, far more damaging than carbon dioxide that we hear so much about. Over in the USA, they may have 2 million unconventional oil and gas wells by now. It's so bad you can see the methane hotspots from space with a satellite. At some stage, someone's gonna fly a satellite over Queensland. In California, back in 2015, we had the Aliso Canyon incident. It was a blowout at a gas storage well, <coughs> similar to the gas storage facility we have in the Otways. And for five months, this thing blew out. You couldn't see it with the naked eye. Again, this is an infrared image that can see the methane. So this released so much greenhouse gas that if you've ever heard about all the good things that California might have been doing positively on the climate space, this pretty much wiped out any good thing that California ever did. Gas is hardly a clean choice. Here again, using methane sensing technology, we see thousands of gas leaks across the streets of Boston in the USA. If you walk down the street and smell gas, this is what's going on. Fossil gas is hardly a clean fuel. I suppose the best thing about gas is that it's invisible. If you could see it, you wouldn't use it. So, how do we get the most out of your heat pump? I have a few more slides here about getting the most out of your hot water heat pump, should you happen to already own one. You might wanna insulate your tank. Well, you might wanna put it indoors in the first place. This one is ducted up so that the air, the heat can get to the heat pump and the heat gets extracted to put in the water, but it all happens indoors, which can be handy because this tank isn't exposed to the weather and it's not losing any heat there. Others, including some Renew members, have had goes at thinking about insulating the pipework or insulating the tank outside. That's another thing you can do. Um, we could talk about water pressure and the impacts on heat pumps and pressure reducing valves and pressure relief valves, but maybe we'll get into that if people ask questions. Uh, Filters, turns out there's filters on some of these heat pumps and they can get clogged up and shut your unit down. Who knew that? Did you buy one? Did anyone tell you when you bought it? So, but I might skip through those and wait for questions. Um, I'll leave you with this one. As a home energy consultant, I say to folks, you know, it can be really hard to make a good decision when you're cold, wet, and naked. <laughs> So if your water heater is getting old, it's a good time to have a replacement plan ready to go. Do the research, get some quotes, be ready to act. Otherwise, say if you have a gas burner and it packs up, if you're in a rush on Christmas Eve, you might let a plumber talk you into replacing like with like. So then you're stuck on the gas grid for another 10 or 20 years. The gas industry loves it when you do that. The end, see you on Facebook. Bet. Questions, and I think Peter's walking around somewhere, and I'll walk around on this side. So we'll start with the ladies. A couple of small practical things. Do you need um, to change the gauge of pipes? I've got a very old house, and I often have problems with plumbing um, gauge of pipes. Do you need three-phase electricity? And how long does how long does the water in the tank stay? hot if you just have twice a day 
heating, which I currently have on my resistive. Right, so three questions there. So pipe work. <coughs> One thing that I learned, and I'm still learning, is that um, when this sandin was installed, it comes with a pressure reducing valve to protect the sandin down to 500 kPa. And it turns out that the water pressure coming into your whole house is really meant to be controlled to 500 kPa um, so that you don't damage a lot of other things in your home. But at our home in Sandringham, you know, uh, I measured out here 750 kPa by, the, by where the water comes onto the property. And I rang up Southeast Water and they said they were happy if it was anywhere between 500 and 850. That, that was their responsibility. They, so they were happy with where it was at. So probably ideally, I should put a pressure reducer here on everything coming to my house and protect everything in my house down to 500 kPa. I do recall one time we had a faucet that just sprung a leak, you know, like right through the metal. And I said, oh, it's a terrible faucet, but it, was, it had been quite old, but maybe at a lower water pressure that wouldn't have happened so fast. And, um, you know, I do have fittings that blow apart with the plastic fittings on the water hoses in the garden and stuff like that. So again, that you know, would be a bit more under control at 500 kPa. Of course, there can be downsides. My daughter-in-law, when my son put a pressure regular on his whole system, she didn't like it that it was harder to flush the poo out of the nappies because their water pressure was lower. So at our house right at the moment, the sand is protected to 500 kPa, and that's what the hot water comes out at, but our cold water is still up at the higher pressure. And so it's probably a little tricky on the controls on the shower because you're mixing the high pressure cold water with the lower pressure hot water. And that would probably work better too if they were at the same level. So the answer to, do you have to change the pipes and things? I don't think so, no. But you may have this pressure issue that maybe you should address anyway if you've got high pressure into your property. Whereas anything you buy these days, new washing machine, et cetera, it's going to say at once, 500 kPa and if something breaks you might even have trouble with an insurance claim or something because they'll say well hang on it was meant to be 500 kPa and we just measured 750. And yeah yeah because you you can ring up Southeast Water or whoever and they'll say at your location you know you give them your location and they got to model the whole system and they say outside your door Tim we're happy if it's anywhere between 500 and a thousand. So they consider that to be their responsibility and you take it from there. And if you just bought something that says meant to be 500, then uh, you might want to address that. So you get a plumber in, he puts a reducing valve on. If that were the case, then, you know, Sandin wouldn't really need this reducing valve to protect the Sandin, but Sandin's protecting the Sandin by saying that that sort of thing has to be installed. So that was your question about water pipes, I think. Um, you asked about electricity. Now, no three phase needed because this sand and it's a thousand watts. That's less than a hairdryer. That's less than a kettle. So, you know, it's one of the more mellow users of electricity. And I think all of them are at pretty low levels. So um, doesn't mean you need any special electrical connection. I mean, you can't just plug it into the wall. You know, you'll get a, you know, you'll get a electrician do a proper job. And then what was the third question? I'm only good for remembering two. Oh, um, Oh yeah. Well, so so ours. Um, yeah, we we run ours once a day, and that works for us. With such a big tank, three hundred fifteen liters. But like I said, maybe we're not big water users users normally. Although sometimes we have three and four people staying at the house, and I've been taking two showers a day lately with the sinus conditions um, and um, so that water is just going to stay hot around you know to the next morning I mean I don't notice a shower here being any hotter than a shower here one interesting thing in these tanks is hot water strata is hot water is lighter than cold water and it stratifies in the tanks and the tanks are all designed to take advantage of that so what happens is as you use the hot water at the top the cold water comes in the bottom but it's not mixing. They, they, you know, there's even some designs inside the tanks to try to make sure that things don't get all stirred up and mixed. So they try to use this stratification. And so um, hot, 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 hot. But if you use it all up, like when my son decided that he'd fill up his bathtub, I think it's a 315 liter bathtub. And guess what? 
<laughs> he wasn't happy. So we said his, or she wasn't happy. <laughs> um, so we said his Santa might stand in the run just whenever it feels like it. And so they're not going to run out of hot water. Now I want to revisit that and ask them if they're ever going to fill up the tub again and get back onto something similar to what we have. There you go. Yeah. Um, just a question about plumbers. Like, do you got any words of wisdom or caution about engaging plumbers? And um, yeah, you mentioned electricians as well, but obviously that's just to get power to it. But being there's an air conditioning unit to it, what do we need to be careful of? Yeah, the, the plumbing thing. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's good to have a plumber who knows your system. And like Alan and I had a three hour meeting with Steve Weltron and you know, they're Germans, they do things differently. You know, I don't know everything that's going on inside of their heat pump. They're all different. They all do some slightly different things. And so it's probably handy if you have a plumber who knows your unit and then they could, you know, they would know about these sorts of issues, hopefully. And the other interesting thing is, um, so I had plumber Craig Smith come and visit our house and um, to deal with the pressure issue. So I still had some mysteries around, around the pressure issue and these relief valves, because this, this valve started passing all the time, continuous leak of water, which is no good. Um, so I wasn't happy with that. Now there's another one of these pressure relief valves up the top set at 700 KPA and this one was at like 600 or something. Anyway, Craig came around and he got rid of this one because you don't need it uh, officially. And so now it can't leak if it's not there. Um, <laughs> so there's a longer story we could get into there, but that's one of the problems that he fixed. He also, I was fiddling around with this thing and I never should have touched it. So he put that back where it's meant to be. <laughs> but hey, we're all renew people, right? So we do these things. And what happens, the reason is this is here for two reasons this lower relief valve set at a lower pressure than your main safety valve, which is up the top. Your main safety valve, you're pretty much familiar with that if you've had a gas water heater. You meant to go over and just crack it open from time to time and just make sure it still works. That's still up there. But with these heat pumps, well, you'll get thermal expansion as they're, you're heating up. And when they're heating up, they will pass a little bit of water, but it's not meant to be continuous. So now, and the, one of the reasons for having this here is if you're passing a bit of water, well, being at the bottom of the tank, it would be cold water. I've got rid of it, so now we pass a little bit of water at the other one, but it's hot. So I'm losing energy by getting rid of this valve. But um, the other reason it was there, and Alan says this is by law in South Australia, where they have poor water quality, is as water heats up, you're more likely to get fouling from salts. And so in order, in order to protect the valve up top to make sure it's always gonna be ready to go in South Australia, they have this one down low, which is set at lower pressure, but it's also on cooler water, so it's less likely to foul up. And so it's kind of double protection on the pressure for South Australia. But for Victoria, it's not required by law, and it's not required by Sandon, and so Craig took it, took it off in our case. But the other thing about what Craig did also for, you know, so this is a plumber who knows Sandons, and you're not gonna find many plumbers that know Sandons. Um, and so you might not find many plumbers that know Stevels or Quantums or any other thing. And they may or may not be as fussy as Sandin's. I don't know. I haven't studied them all. But this thing about the filter. So the Sandin system turns out it had three filters in it. So Craig said, took them all out and said, throw them away. Um, one of them was a little bit clogged. And he said that was possibly getting close to shutting down the unit. You'd get an error code. And we've had some members on my efficient electric home that have run into this. And it wasn't much. It's just a little bit of brown stuff. But then Craig did another thing. He broke a... Uh, we're up the top somewhere. He took a pipe apart, turned the water back on, and so we got this fountain of water coming out. And it was nice and clean, and then it ran brown. So basically it was a flush. And so there's brown gunk in the sand in there somewhere that Craig recommends a flush. Now the sand and manuals talk about the filter, but they don't say anything about a flush. So um, I was talking to Craig about that today. And so that's another one of the slight disappointments with this heat pump industry that they may not necessarily be telling everybody everything they need to know just yet. So there you go. If you get a plumber that specifically knows the unit, turns out over at my son's place where he had the same water pressure issue, same problem, he didn't get rid of this valve because he called some other plumber. He's tired of waiting for me to solve the problem. <laughs> so he called some other plumber who put the pressure regulator upstream 
of his whole house and fix the problem. So I haven't done that. I probably should have done that. Craig didn't recommend that. Maybe Craig should have done that. Different plumbers, different ideas. Yeah. Hello. Is it me? Yeah. Um, I had a question about um, at home, I've got a hydronic uh, heater, which is run by an instantaneous gas hot water service, which costs an absolute Instant bomb. Instantaneous? Yeah, it costs a fortune to run. It's three hours in the morning, five or six hours in the evening, and yeah. plus if it's very cold. So is there any role for a heat pump? So is, is, it, is it through radiators or under floor? It's to radiators. It's to radiators. Uh, yeah, get a heat pump. Ah, okay. <clears throat> Get a heat pump. Now the drama there, and so some members of my fish and electric home are doing that. And uh, you know, you could start a chat with Steve Oeltron, for example. They they love hydronic heating. Right. I'm not a big fan of hydronic heating, but you've already got it, so yeah. you, know, you might as well try and make the mess of it. The drama is that a heat the water that'll come out of the heat pump won't be as hot as the water that came out of your gas heater. And so you may need to run it longer and not expect it to be building out this really hot heat from your radiators. But if you have a you know, decent thermal envelope for your home, maybe you only need to get a modest amount of heat into it, and so you just run the heat pump for longer to get the same amount of kilowatt hours into the house that the gas system could do faster and hotter, and it would feel great because it's like radiant and everything. Um, mm. So that could be a solution there. But how do you cool your house? Um, mainly with fans. Sorry, mainly with fans. We hardly ever, fans. We've got it's a 70s house. We've got yep. one old, one of those huge old weather walls yep. in the TV room, which would yep. turn on maybe four or five times a year. So yeah. So this, this is the presentation I more often give, which has to do with space heating and cooling with reverse cycle air conditioners. So what you find are a lot of people like yourself who have gotten by for years without having active space cooling, whether it's evaporative or refrigerative, they, they haven't got it. But eventually you're going to weaken <laughs> and you're going to want to get some active cooling and so you'll get a, a refresh an efficient reverse cycle air conditioner maybe in the bedroom first maybe in your living space you'll use it for summer cooling ah and then come next winter you'll say hey, i wonder if i can use that rather than turning on the hydronic and that's what we did so we used to have in an old weatherboard in sandringham we used to have ducted gas of course installed in 1994 or something and um so then we put reverse cycle air conditioners in each end of the house one bedroom one main room and now that heats the whole house, we've thrown away the ducted gas heating, and we heat for a third of what we used to heat using the ducted gas. I mean, we've got, you know, we, you know, we, we don't overheat the place. We've got some double glazed windows. It's pretty well insulated, except there's no insulation under the floor. And I'd like to make further upgrades, but I can't economically justify them because we hardly spend anything on heating anymore. That's really annoyed me. <laughs> so that's what we find a lot of members of my fish and electric home doing. Now, finally buying that first air conditioner. But then when you're doing it, think about where you'll use it. You know, you'll use it for, you know, hopefully no more, no more than 20 days through summer, but then you can use it for 150 days across the whole winter heating season. Um, so think about where you're gonna put it for that point of view. And in fact, you know, most often our split system air conditioners are mounted up high, but if you go to New Zealand, they're down here. And if you go to Tasmania, they're down here because they realize that it's mostly a device for heating. And you'd like to have your heat down low so that the hot air rises, whereas too often we're thinking an air conditioner is just for cooling, we put it up high so the cool air comes down. Um, so anyway, I've written a number of articles about all of this. One published in Renew Magazine, Renew 133, was a tale of two heaters. And so we put the air conditioners in there and then come went for summer. But then come winter, I was running outside under similar weather conditions one day, measuring how much gas we were burning, and on the next day, measuring how much electricity we were using and trying to make a comparison. That's where I came up with this idea that our heating costs had dropped to a third of what they had been by using the reverse cycle air conditioners. What temperature do they heat For the hot water? Yeah. For the hot water, they're pretty much controlled to... Um, to uh, store the water, heat the water and store the water at 60 degrees. But then there's a tempering valve that brings the water, temp mixes cold water with it and brings the temperature down to 50 degrees so that we don't have scalding. So uh, you're old, and this is another thing that can happen when you upgrade from a 20 year old gas system to a new heat pump, is you won't get water coming out at a you know, very high temperature, you know, and you might not like that, but then again, you won't be scalding your grandchildren. So it's new regulations that have come in that say you have to have the tempering valve 
and the water doesn't come out at you at the sink any hotter than 50 degrees. But then Stiebel was saying they got a little trick um, that if you want to try and store more, the, the reason it's meant to be the 60 degrees is because that can be guaranteed to kill Legionella bacteria. Um, and Legionella can be deadly. Um, and so that's why you have to at least get to the 60 degrees. And, and some people with their, you know, their rooftop solar thermal, some people say, oh, I shut the boost off, you know, for six months a year. They're not necessarily getting their water up to 60 degrees. So they're not necessarily killing the Legionella bacteria. But then Alan says that only one person has ever died from the Legionella bacteria in the shower. And that person was 95 years old. Um, so, but those are, those are how the regulations are set up. But Stiebel, Stiebel has another little trick. Stiebel has another little trick along this thermal battery idea that they actually heat the water even a little bit hotter if you want to using your cheap solar PV electricity using, I think, the, the, the booster they've got in their unit. So that's just another way to, if you want to stick a bit more energy into your water tank. Hello, just a question about, you said earlier the um, early quantums and uh, units were failing. Is there? No, I didn't say quantum was failing. Oh, well, the earlier heat pumps failed. That's why I wrote a speech, because every word cannot be held yeah, up against it me. It gave, gave the industry or a heat pump a bad name. So salt air, was that a part of it? Because there's, uh, I know a lot of air conditioners now that have got a blue fin technology or something that's supposed to be resistant, but mm, that's mm, the only thing mm, I've heard mm, of heat pumps mm, failing mm, with salt mm. air. Mm. Look, uh, maybe I'll let Alan try to answer. You want to try and answer that one? What happened a long time ago before I was born? <laughs> <laughs> or before I came to Australia or something? Um, well, there are a few things. One is uh, a lot of the older ones were very A lot of older ones were very noisy. And also the older ones uh, didn't work too well in cold weather. Um, so they, they were two major factors. And um, certainly, the, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that's right. They, they just weren't really well, well enough designed. I think the technology was just a bit early. And also, um, you know, they, they were trying to keep the cost down. So it was just a mix of issues like that. People, you know, plumbers who didn't know much about them installing them in ways that weren't too good um, so it's just I mean it, it, it's it's just a combination of things like that really the as far as I understand it um, but I, I guess this is where particularly the, the co2 heat pumps don't don't need um, a boosting heating element because they they're designed for Japanese conditions where it's fairly crisp at times. Yeah, this, yeah this is rated to work down to minus 10. Mm. So, and the Dakin air conditioner is rated to work down to minus 20. Mm. Yeah. And well, and you can see the, the new label for reverse cycle air conditioners is actually the efficiencies are zoned for the different climate zones in Australia. So, I mean, I think you're just looking at a fairly cheap technology that wasn't well installed that, um, you know, was early stage technology really. Yep. But lots of people, as, as Tim said, have, have very good memories about <laughs> painful these, experiences. <laughs> these quantums had a date on them, 2009. They were still working outside a cafe in Malmesbury. How efficient they were running, I'm not sure, but uh, they were still there chugging away. And they had, you know, someone had written when maintenance had been done of one sort or another on there. Like I said, this one's rated to minus 10 degrees outside. It should still function. Um, whereas this one here, I think, is officially rated to five degrees. So um, you might not want to use this in the coldest place, or you would certainly you know, want to work it out so that it comes on in the middle of the day rather than at six o'clock in the morning when it's its coldest time. Um, thank you. Um, I have a three-year-old energy efficient house and I love it. I don't have any energy bills basically. And I have the sand and heat pump, same as yours. One thing you haven't mentioned is running it on rainwater because my house is all on rainwater and I've had a bit of a problem with it and sand and last time I spoke to them they said, well, you shouldn't run it on rainwater. Are you, so, in, are, are you in my fish and electric home? No, I'm going to go we, on we there. We need to start a discussion <laughs> about this one because last night outside of Ballarat, I was staying at an off-grid house and they run their sand on rainwater and... and um, he needs to look at his filter, I suppose, because he's had it about two and a half years or three years as long as I have. 
but he's expecting he's probably not going to a lot of not not even going to have as much dirt in there as what I have from the Melbourne water system. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've already had mine flushed once after um, fifteen months, and it's uh, showing the error message again. So Ooh, I've still okay. got on rainwater. You want Craig Smith's phone number? Yeah, I might. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's okay. on the Facebook group. Okay. Anyway, thank you. So I guess Craig's yes. the only one I'm giving an ad for tonight. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm a chemist and an engineer. I wasn't smart enough to be a chemical engineer. No. <laughs> but but um, smart enough to work I'm more concerned about costs. We, we actually look at uh, uh, air conditioners, one kilowatt air conditioners are all under $1,000. One kilowatt refrigerators are all under $1,000. I had a quote to install a sand last week on a site that already has everything, electricity, gas, Works. $4,000. And 5200 after he'd taken the STCs. Yeah. That's that's very high. I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard more than 4000 You sure that the $1,000 STCs were taken out? I haven't got the written quote. He just said it would be 5200 out of my pocket. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, check and see how they've handled the STCs. I'm surprised it's much more than that 4000 <clears throat> But that's, that's the cost of it. Um, you know, Alan would say there's... 10 of these so-called eco-cute sort of carbon dioxide uh, hot water heaters available on the market in Japan. And for a long time, we've only had one. Now we have another one, it's called Reclaim. And guess what? They are offering it at a, the exact same price as the Sandin. <laughs> so the competition hasn't really come in and done a lot for us just yet. But um, look, uh, Chris, down the back, you've got the, the Quantum with propane refrigerant and you know, you're pretty happy with it. And that was $2,000. You were only one thousand out of pocket, right? So there's yes, yeah, you know, depending on your services, you you know, it's a little bit noisier than the sand in, but it doesn't bother you, you know. So you got to look at the, and it's a smaller tank, but it's a small, you know, they're they're efficient water users. So what brand? So that might be something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I say, some people are getting these on the Facebook group practically free because the. Uh, you know, renewable energy credits were paying for maybe everything but the install. And so it's rated to only down to five degrees. So don't run it below five degrees. Be a bit noisier, maybe that's not a problem. Tank's not as big, maybe that's not a problem. For, uh, for, for air conditioning, it's traditionally been that you would put the air conditioner on the southern side of the house so it's in the shade to bring the cool air in. Is there a benefit in terms of these heat pumps where we're then using it for heating to actually situate it on the north side or in the sun, or is the air probably, temperature much probably the, same? the main thing to worry about, both for for the uh, hot water and the um, and the space heaters, uh, has to do with uh, icing. So this may be rated to minus ten, but if it's like two degrees in Sandringham and fairly humid, you can get ice forming because the refrigerant's in there is really cold. So why wouldn't you get some ice? Um, so you can get these things icing up. The hot water system, you know, it realizes it's smart enough these days with all the sensors, it knows when it's iced up and so then it'll bring a bit of hot water back through and melt the ice and then it'll go again. You'll probably never notice. It can be a little more sensitive with a space heater. Like when you wake up in the morning, you're like, I'm cold in the house, I'm gonna <laughs> flog my air conditioner and it's two degrees outside in Sandringham and the thing goes, the nice ice is up. Uh, but then it goes through a defrost cycle, but for 10 minutes you don't have any heat coming out. So that's probably a bigger issue and what we found on my fish and electric home around um, the winter solstice this year, you know, we have more and more people with the air conditioners. And so they had some icing issues like out around Ballarat and places like that. And it can be, in that case, it can be important, you know, how much thermal mass and the rest of it you have around the device. And, you know, you kind of have to think like the air conditioner, is this thing likely to get hold of cold, humid air and then ice up? Maybe if it's installed next to a building that has some thermal mass then that might not happen or how's the airflow going to go and we hope we you know, mm -hmm. we hope we have more and more installers in those particularly sensitive regions like central victoria or whatever that are developing a bit more of a, an idea as to to what can happen here because you know it's no disaster if it ices up you wait 10 minutes and it gets going again um but uh you know if you can based on where you're putting it um you know, you might be able to, uh, you know, reduce the, that issue a bit. And so it's less about having it in the sun just to make it more efficient. I would think more of that worst case scenario and how can you avoid the worst case scenario. 
Um, Can I on? just? You've already had three questions. <laughs> it's a very quick one. They were very good ones. <laughs> it's a very good question. <laughs> it's a very quick one. Um, just, is there any functional benefit in having an integrated system or a split level split mm -hmm. system? I can see the practicality, but what about the functionality? Yeah, well, one good thing you could do with the split, like it says, is you could put the tank in, inside. And, uh, you know, we've got some um, members from America on my fishing like we're and they think we're crazy that Australians put their water tanks outside the house. Maybe they're afraid someone will steal them or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> but with the split system, you have the opportunity there to put the tank inside, which could be cool. Jenny Edwards, who uh, runs Lighthouse Architecture and Science up in Canberra, she's an admin on the Facebook group, and, and she built a special little room in her new house for her sand and uh, tank next to her laundry. With the, this bit has to be outside, of course, so it can get hold of the air. But, well, generally, unless you, I mean, there are, in America, they, they do put these things like in garages. And so you freeze the garage, but it can still get enough heat out of the garage to heat the water. And then we did see that one where there was a ducted system where yeah, ducting would bring the air to the unit and take it away. So that's the split system. The all in one, you know, maybe easier to install. It all comes in one piece. Um, Chris, you've got this, this uh, quantum where I call it a side by side because it's two pieces but you really don't have any flexibility of moving the two pieces around. They pretty much just have to sit there side by side. But you're saying quantum was coming out with a split system. Yeah. Yeah, so if anything ever happened to your heat pump for quantum, you can take that away. And over here, I guess there's a resistive element that could get you by until uh, the heat pump got fixed. Fancy, there's all these little, there's all these little features, I mean, the Facebook group started as the, you know, Dakin Aruru Sarara discussion group. So four years ago, we started a Facebook group just to try to decode one air conditioner and figure out everything it does. I, f I feel like putting together another Facebook group just to try to decode my AEG washing machine. I mean, I can't figure out what it's doing. And the same thing here. So all these devices we get these days, they have functions. You know, you know, are they good functions? Should I know about them? Can I ignore them? Technology run amok sometimes for people above a certain age. Tim, I'd like some further comments on the lifespan and reliability of the heat pumps. The reason I ask is um, my electrician has had two fail. Um, one he got back under warranty and the, the second one he, he's given up on. So, um, but was he just unlucky? I don't know. Um, you know, we've got, we got, 9,000 members in my fish and electric home now, and a, a few of them would have hot water heat pumps, and we're not hearing that many stories of failures outside of straight away. I mean, you can get bad equipment straight away, and that's what the three-year warranty period is. You know, it's something's wrong, and you go, you replace it, and you fix that bit. But no, I'm not, not hearing too many stories of issues. Yeah, well, you'd hope so, except, you know, you have some little features like that sand and filter clogging up, and then, um, and then giving you an error message. And Alan, you did something fancy. So you're saying there's a condensate line comes out of this thing? There's, um, there's a little like opening out here that lets the condensate water go away. I was being very water efficient and put a, a hose on it so that it would water my garden. But then of course spiders and snails crawled in there. It got clogged up and I got error. Error, so that's, so that's error E124, if uh, you're interested. <laughs> but the manual doesn't tell you what E124 is. You know, the internet doesn't tell you what E124 is, so that's disappointing. You know, it should have said, Alan, you got snails in your pipe. <laughs> Sounds good, and get on My Fish and Electric Home, and that's gonna be our database of information. <laughs> So one here. Um, first, uh, perhaps a couple of comments. Um, I think there's a difference between a pressure limiting valve and a pressure reducing valve, although the, the term reducing valve is used as a general thing. Um, I'm not a plumber, so don't quote me on that, but my, a plumber once told me that what I needed was a pressure limiting valve and not a reducing valve, um, because the reducing valve reduces the pressure. Uh, you know, from whatever it is to, you know, by a certain ratio, whereas a limiting valve just keeps it at a certain valve. Um, but I might be wrong on that. 
Also, I suspect that if you try to duct a, uh, um, a, uh, a heat pump uh, hot water service that wasn't designed for it, you'd probably blow your warranty. Um, um, yeah, yeah, and a few other things as well. Yeah, you run the risk of not getting enough air and also just damaging yeah, the equipment. So, so yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend doing stuff that that uh, you know that um, is a little bit unusual. The um, you know even putting some insulation around it, um, you you want to make sure that you don't get water underneath the insulation because then maybe you could start to uh, rust your your tank due to corrosion under insulation. And if you're getting water underneath your insulation anyway, it's not doing a very good job of insulating. So yeah, you can all, there's always unintended consequences that, you know, us bright, run, bright young things associated with Renew can attempt and it shoots us in the foot. Yeah. Uh, now another question though. Um, uh, I'm interested in, uh, I've got uh, uh, floor heating, uh, water floor heating, um, which I want to not entirely replace with uh, reverse cycle air conditioners because I know from experience that the radiant, the, the load temperature radiant heat from the floor um, is very comfortable as long as you use it as a, as a background heat rather than a, uh, you know, the main source of heat. Um, and, uh, and I'm supported in that by the CSIRO. Um, but um, I'm interested in using the quantum uh, heat pump hot water units to heat the floor. But they're, they specifically say they're not suited to, to hydronic or floor heating. Um, but on a kilowatt per kilowatt basis, they're, they're cheaper than, uh, than the, uh, than the yeah, there was offering. A, for there was a fellow, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he ganged up together three sandins to... My, uh, yeah, that was my yeah, intention, yeah. Your intention, right. And so somebody actually did it. It might be Rowan. Um, and, uh, you know, Sandin didn't like it so much, I guess, because... Sandin says, well, we've got a lot of crappy houses in Australia and you do that. I mean, instead of running two hours a day, the thing might be running 24 hours a day. So now you're running it 12 times longer. We should shorten the warranty by 12 times. <laughs> so that, that I think, and you know, Sandin being Japanese, whatever, they're not terribly aggressive in wanting to do anything other than giving you a hot water heat pump. So once again, it's a, it's a warranty thing rather than a fundamental engineering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tim, we've got a, um, I think, a pretty much identical system to you, um, with a sand and out, with a sand and uh, compressor outside and the tank inside. No, we're not inside. Oh, but you, anyway, okay, yep. right. How's the inside? That was Jenny and Canberra. Double, double brick wall. Um, Three fifteen liter tank. A um, couple of observations. It um, with just a two of us, it seems to be just coasting very nicely and uh, manages very well. Occasionally, we have four plus a toddler having baths. And it's also seemed to have managed that beautifully as well. Um, do you can, do you use the block out timer to not have it yes, come on at certain it, times? Uh, we, we, we've got a fair amount of solar on the roof, so it, mm -hmm. it runs between, it's allowed to run between um, uh, in Dallas having time midday and 3 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. 3 p.m. because we have mm -hmm. a, a lot of Western exposure mm -hmm. with the PV. Mm -hmm. So that, that works very well. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how often it runs and uh, ever running out of water, uh, no, we've ne never had it happen. In fact, I don't think even no, my son's it's only auxiliary one heating. Yeah. Uh, you, you might be aware that about 60% up the tank wall, there's a thermistor, mm -hmm. which senses the temperature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the trick is that if the cold water boundary hits that thermistor, mm -hmm. meaning you've only got about 40% capacity left, mm -hmm. it will turn it on regardless. Regardless? Yes, I think... I think regardless. I, I, yeah, I see. Who knows? Managed, <laughs> I, and if you... Um, you, you can dig out the, the, the sand and technical design manual. It's mm -hmm. on the web. I managed to find it and I found that little... Oh, well, we need that on My Fish and Electric Home, please. Uh, <laughs> you could sure. upload that as a and, file. Um, and just one other little gotcha. Uh, our installation was rather peculiar where the heat pump itself ended up being at about the height of the top of the tank. Yeah. And guess what happened? It thermosiphons. Yes. Um, after some tangling with a plumber and then some further refinements myself, I finally got the thermos, I think, to stop. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd certainly say that most plumbers mm -hmm. don't really understand mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are obviously a few who need to teach all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's good stuff. See you on Facebook. <laughs> we, we already have a solar thermal hot water system mm -hmm. with a, um, an instantaneous gas booster. Mm -hmm. I was looking at replacing the gas booster mm -hmm. with a heat pump. Mm -hmm. But all the inquiries I make, I get told that none of the heat pumps will take the potentially hot water out of mm -hmm. the solar panels. Richard Keach has done it. So 
And Richard's probably even written it up in Renew Magazine, but uh, either via the Facebook group or Renew Magazine, Richard Keach has got a quantum and a uh, evacuated tube solar thermal system. And so he did it. I don't know if there's warranty issues there or whatever, but he did it. I would have thought it was a reasonably common use case. Oh, look, that's a, you know, Richard's probably got, you know, we're getting close probably to $8,000 worth of hot water heater there with everything he's got, <laughs> which is a lot for hot water, frankly. Oh, and maybe the quantum, maybe 6,000. Okay, I was going to change my mind, but anyway, I am gathering my courage to ask whether whether we can all go out, you know, whether we can live without solar, or with, without hot water system at all, because I don't. I haven't had it for on for yeah. 10 years. Yeah, that was the first question I asked. And Who really needs a dedicated hot water yeah, system? Yeah, and nor do I have heating on at all. Yeah. No, yeah. I, my yeah. aircon has gone broken for yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Yes, so is it, you know, really serious because the climate change issue is so serious thank you okay good questions good questions hi um thank you very much for the presentation it's answered most of my outstanding questions and my next step is to order a sandum um, my situation however is perhaps a little bit unusual i've got uh, five kilowatts of solar 13 kilowatt hours of battery storage and the battery tries to optimize the storage um, and adding a load which also requires optimization to, to minimize the running cost is, an, is another variable and I'm just wondering how I should approach that. Should I write the software to do it myself or is there a product out there on the market to do that? Because from an energy management perspective it seems, it seems ideal that you should with current transformers be able to measure current going in and out in all directions and just build some simple software and, and manage it. But, has someone come up with a product that will do that? And my second question is, uh, you mentioned central Victoria, and that's where I live, and we're running in a regime of minus four to plus 40, um, and the, I'm converting my house to all electric, which includes getting rid of gas ducted heating, getting rid of a gas instantaneous water heater, replacing everything with reverse cycle air conditioning, and uh, with uh, a induction cooktop and so on and so forth. Um, and the capital investment has been quite huge. And I calculated my return on investment on the, uh, on, on the solar part of the infrastructure as being over 10 years to get my money back. But I decided to do it anyway, because it's an interesting task. But I'm interested in, 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 in your, uh, your comments on what there is for, for uh, ancillary products that will optimize the use further, rather than just having a time switch. Now, you've probably gone beyond my knowledge there and so that's a good question for you know the brain power of renew i suppose or you could put it on the facebook group um chris has probably already got to figure it out what to, what you're doing <laughs> with what he does but um yeah that's a that's a good question um how to integrate all those things yeah it's a bit of an unusual case yeah. i just wanted to share my experience with um just especially for the gentleman about the hydronic heating We've, uh, last four years, our house is full electric. Um, we've got five kilowatts of power on the roof. We're on the 66 cent tariff, which is good. So I run my heat pumps at night time. Um, it's a lot cheaper. But uh, our heating has got a five kilowatt heat pump. And we run skirting boards on the top and under floor heating, just below the floorboards downstairs. So um, it does take a while for it to heat up. Um, We've invested in the Google Nest thermostats. So um, it works out when it needs to. When we get home at six, six o'clock, we want it 20 degrees. It works out when it comes on all by itself. So, cool. Yeah. Yep. Now, my, my other thing that I'm doing now is that um, with all this heat, we've only got evaporative cooling. Um, and I'm starting to play with fan coils because our heating, a five kilowatt heat pump for the hydronic heating um, is also reverse cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. That'll be my next project. Yeah, very good. Yeah, sounds excellent. Yeah. So either articles for Renew or uh, posts for My Fish and Electric Home. Or both. Or both. <laughs>
I was just uh, sorry, wondering about the economics of um, the heat pumps. I've been following this for a number of years, and um, uh, if you're saving two hundred and thirty dollars a year, and you've got your heat pump, I got a price today of a Sandon one with the STCs off the price, and it costs four thousand eight hundred dollars. What's going on with these Sandons? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that was off. Oh, the Australian dollar? Uh, mm, mm. So, given that situation, and then to, to get that particular price, you'd have to put on a five or kil six kilowatt system, which would now cost you another out of pocket three to four thousand, maybe. Uh, you're looking at what, seven thousand eight hundred odd. And um, I think you're looking at 20 years plus to get break even. So, uh, does that sound about right? Um, plus the, my, I'm very interested in this, my current gas heater is 13 years old and that's the average I get out, got out of the last two as well. So I'm getting ready to change. I'm very happy to go to gas, but, oh, sorry, go to electricity. Um, but given that investment, and also, sorry, the heat pumps have got moving parts, whereas the, Gas heaters got very little moving parts and seems to just go forever and no noise. Can you uh, help me out on the economic case? And given that mm -hmm. if I want to go fully to electricity, that means I've also ha um, have to change my gas burner to induction, another couple of thousand, and of course, um, your reverse cycle air conditioner, another I got a price to do two rooms and there's another 4,000. So we're looking at a considerable investment and um, at this stage in life with not much income, I'm finding it very difficult to get there. So can you mm -hmm, sort mm -hmm. of justify it economically? Mm -hmm. One, um, putting that question in the context more of solar PV, I wrote an article once, 22 ways to reduce your energy bills before you bother with the solar PV. So, um, you know, even, you know, issues like draft proofing and insulation and window coverings might be better investments and also give you, you know, better uh, comfort than some of these other things. I think just with respect to the hot water heat pump, if that's for the price of the Sandins, it's gone. Yeah, it's getting pretty hard to justify them economically. You, you might want to have 10 people in the building using a heck of a lot of uh, hot water. Um, so look at some cheaper options, maybe the Quantum or the Stiebel or any of those other 257 mic makes and models. <laughs> Well, that's right. I mean, to, to replace a gas system, you're, you know, might be looking at two thousand dollars anyway. So you take that away, and so it's that incremental that uh, you're talking about. But um, you know, if you were, you know, Chris, you ended up replacing a solar thermal hot water system, and you only spent a thousand bucks. So there you go. Um, you know, out of pocket. Yeah, what's the future gas price going to be with my special graph there that we don't know where the gas is coming from in 2025? <laughs> yeah, well, the big the big prize that um, you know was pointed out in that report by Renew is that one of the big prizes when you finally get rid of your gas meter. So you're probably paying three hundred dollars a year, whatever, being connected to the gas grid, and so that's finally what puts you over the edge. Like if uh, you know to try to justify the upgrade of the cooking, you know we're we're in a situation where we hardly use any gas at all. Our bill is just the fixed connection charges, but that will be the prize when we finally get off altogether. Just a couple more questions, please. I think we've got one at the back. Um, um, thanks, Tim. Just really quickly, uh, related to that, uh, related, related to the previous question, if the gas hot water is your last gas appliance that you've got, it, um, but for instance, our one is seven years old at the moment, it's the last gas appliance that we'll have, would you be going down the road of replacing it now before it fails, um, especially in light of the uh, upfront cost, which is pushing $4,800 by the sounds of it? Um, or would you wait for it to fail and then, and then replace it at that point? Yeah, it depends how resilient you're going to be in your home when it fails. Do we get the <laughs> not screaming murder victim uh, effect or not? Um, so you have to take that into account. Look, uh, how many years old did you say it was? Seven. Yeah, look, I'm seeing water, water heaters out there that are 20 years old plus. So some of them do last. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't sound our, like it's a crisis emergency situation. Our previous one was like 25 years old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
it might be more, you know, keep an eye on the Australian dollar or something, or right. where are their bargains? I mean, I think some of the quantum, there were some run out uh, models there that uh, potentially, you know, like buying a car, you know, ring up on the 29th of June, you know, you might get a, yeah. you might get a discount sort of thing happening. Um, but uh, for the, the previous question, your biggest use of gas, so gas is a fossil fuel, so reducing the use of gas is a, is a key thing, and your biggest use of gas is gonna be for your home heating. So um, if you can you know, knock, the, knock your home heating down, then you've really contributed. And uh, so if you're still using some gas for hot water cooking for a while, that's the way it goes. Thank you. Um, a, a, a probably a, a bit of a silly question. Um, how well do these type of systems uh, work uh, if, if you have a, a low pressure water system uh, rather than having mains pressure? Is, is there any disadvantage to running them? Yeah, so last night I was staying with this uh, fellow off grid out past uh, Ballarat, and he's got a sand in it and it's on the water tanks. So, tick, I guess that works. That's what I need to know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Tim. It was utterly brilliant. Great. Thanks.